Welcome to the How Humans Work podcast. I am your host, Jeff Z. So glad to have you with us today. We are now in season three, looking at the nature of stress. We're going to dive into this ancient system and the way it works and plays out in our lives and talk with some truly amazing people who have knowledge and insights to help us find our way through the dance of life and the dance of stress that will have heart and truth and love in them. It's going to be amazing, I promise. Let's do this. Enjoy. Here we go. Jimmy Conrad, welcome to the How Humans Work podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to dive into wherever you want to go. There's so many places I do want to go. But before we really dive in deep on the conversation around stress, being a professional athlete, I wanted to just thank you again for coming on the show and let you know I really appreciate you taking the time and, and showing up today. Well, I love diving into this section of development, ultimately, as humans or as players or whatever, because when we identify younger players, let's say, with talent, a lot of it is focused around the technical ability, their tactical understanding, their physical, a lot of physical, oh, look how tall and strong and fast. And, and all those things are important. Don't get me wrong. You need to be strong in those certain areas if you're going to have a long professional career. But really what I've learned and, and basing my own experience, the biggest determinant for success is what's between the ears. So I'm excited that you have this podcast and I'm excited that you had me on. Great. I love that. And so one of the questions I did line up for myself when I was thinking about this session today was just for people who don't know you, because this isn't a, a football or world football or soccer geek podcast. <laughs> this is this is a deep dive into human nature, wherever I can find conversations that interest me. And I've had a chance to play a little footy with you. And I found you to be a really uh, fantastic communicator, have a high level of intensity, and also a kind of positivity about your approach. And so I think those are probably some of your keys to success in terms of between the ears that you're talking about. But I wanted to give people a little picture who don't know the world of football of what you were able to achieve in your life on the field. Yeah, so I'll give you a brief rundown uh, outside of me saying I'm an Aquarius and I like long walks on the beach. That has to get out there uh, first and foremost. I, I grew up in Southern California, and I think what helped was I had a, a grandfather who was Danish. So he was out there kicking the ball with me a lot and, and really, I think, passed on that, that passion for enthusiasm for the game. Now, I've learned from my dad. He passed away when I was 11, but I learned from my dad that he wasn't actually very good. I never actually got to see my grandpa play, but my dad said he was a pretty trash player, but he loved it. He loved going out every weekend and playing with his buddies, and, and I think that is what I caught a little bit, a little bit of that bug, and I understood why that game meant something to him. And, and so you don't really know how to verbalize it when you're younger, but you can feel it. And I, and I felt it. So I grew up there. And what's the benefit of playing in Southern California is you can play year round. And you're also exposed to a lot of different styles. So there's a heavy Latino influence. Right. There is, uh, you have the British, the British invasion is everywhere in some capacity in the beautiful game. And, and you have these influences from different parts around the world. And it's great. And I loved it. And I, and I fell into a space where I had some very good coaches who also had that, that passion and enthusiasm. I think that's a real important thing that kind of runs the line throughout my whole career is that that was kind of the base and the foundation that I had for the game. So I think that helped me deal with adversity can we, in, can, in maybe a different way. Yeah. Go ahead. Can we stop there for a minute? I want to get back into your trajectory, but I want to understand a little bit more the source of that enthusiasm so straight up it was just a transmission from your grandfather or was there more going on there about your nature and who you were in your life that that found that spark no that's a good question so let's we're going to be like uh what's memento or we're going to be jumping all over the place in terms of my timeline my parents had me when they were 18 years old and they could have and probably should have either given me up for adoption or had an abortion because and, and i say that with, with like trying to make that as emotionless as possible. I know it's a hot topic and, and all the good stuff, but, but they sacrificed their own dreams, their whole, the rest of their lives to then say, okay, we're going to take on this responsibility of having a kid. And, and when you grow up in that, now my parents broke up before I was born, so they weren't together. Now they still had a common respect for each other and made sure that my interests were at the forefront. And that was really important. So I kind of, 
And I think this helped me cope with adversity as well. I just learned how to exist in different environments. So if I went over to my dad's side of the family, there's a different sensibility and idea about how to develop as a human being, right? And how they raise their kids. Then I go over to my mom's side and I kind of get exposed to that. And there's uh, alcoholics on that side of the family that I'm seeing and getting my, my grandma's throwing parties and taking shots with grown men. And you're just like all these different worlds. And, and as I live through this, I had a, uh, an epiphany around 23 years old. And I asked myself, why am I the way that I am? Why do I have to fight and prove that I can be somebody? And it hit me at that age. And I was reading a lot of books and, and, um, uh, my identity, I think, was pretty set, but just trying to understand why I was like that. And I think I learned, because my, my, my grandma, my mom's mom, would kind of badmouth my dad sometimes in ways that I couldn't understand. And so I think I understood very early on that, again, I couldn't verbalize it, but I could feel it, that if I became somebody of consequence, and you can define that however you want, put air quotes around that, then it would look better for my parents to have kept me. To, to have made that decision and for all the sacrifice that they put into it, that I needed, I needed to be somebody. I couldn't just be a run-of-the-mill person that just has a normal nine-to-five. Like, I needed to be somebody that, that was pushing and doing things that uh, nobody else in our family had accomplished because then I think everybody would look back and go, we're so glad that my dad got my mom pregnant at 18. And so, so I feel like I had that understanding. And once I had that, and, and, and whether there's, that, there's truth to that or, or if I'm creating that in my own head, we could probably break that down with a proper therapist at some point. But, <laughs> but that was an underlying structure for me, and I, and I fed off of that, and I was motivated by that. And it was, it's a strength but also a weakness because I don't know how to turn that off. Even though I've had my career, and I could have just rested on those laurels after playing professionally for 12 years and playing in a World Cup and being the captain of the U.S. men's national team. And this is a guy I – didn't, I didn't get recruited out of high school. I had to walk on in college. I didn't get drafted into MLS right Like I had to fight. I was a, definitely the little engine that could. But when you kind of look at this formation of who I was and the environment that I grew up in, even though it was very supportive and loving, there was still this fight in me that I needed to be somebody. And nobody was going to tell me I couldn't or couldn't be, could or couldn't be good at, at anything. And so, so there were these little things along the way. And obviously I had some incredible mentors that were seeing this and pushing the buttons in the right way to make sure that I kind of maximize my potential. If you looked up overachiever in the dictionary, I'd have to be close to, to that. But, but at times I feel like I wish I could turn that off and I, and I don't know how to do that because it's so ingrained in me at this point. Well, that's beautiful. I, I mean, I love, I love the depth. I, I love I'm talking to a, a, a professional athlete, but I love where you are at with your own story and the motivation and the heart behind it and how deep of a, personal story that is. So thank you for bringing that, that it, it means a lot and I respect no it problem. deeply. Yeah. So, but there was the foundation, the motivation. You gave a little bit of a picture of your career. You, you can explore any part of it. I, I got told I wasn't, I got told I wasn't good enough. I don't know how many times, how many times. Well, I mean, I had a college coach tell me I would never amount to anything. I had scouts saying I wasn't good enough to be a professional and, and I probably wasn't in some capacity. It's not like they, I just like had to baby step my way into the process. And it was more about me. And I think you learn this as you grow up. It's, it's the external factors are something, but it's always when you, if you really look hard at it, it's always you versus you. Once I grasped that concept, it became a lot easier for me to figure out how to solve some of these problems and give myself a chance. And so that was important in terms of my process as well. I had a pivotal meeting a meeting, I'd say that's a meeting. I didn't meet with this guy one on one, but we had a chance meeting my club team when I was about 15 or 16. And we met the dad of a World Cup player named Marcelo Balboa, who had played in two World Cups for us in the US. And of course, you know, I have my anybody have any questions? My hand goes up and I say, Hey, you know, how did how did Marcelo Balboa play in two World Cups? And now, if you ask me that question now, I'm going to give you a 30 minute answer because I, I love to explore things and I, I like to be detailed and all that, as you can probably already tell. But Louis Balboa, this is his name, he, he probably gets asked this all the time. And he just looked at me and he goes, uh, he just went and worked on his game every day for two hours at the park. And that was it. He moved on to the next question. I was like, wow, uh, brevity is an art form with this guy. But, but I also had a light bulb moment because at that moment I realized that I was in control of how good I was going to be at anything. Now, 
even though that was a pivotal moment for me, when I went out to the school and actually went there, I'm like, all right, cool. Marcelo Balboa's out here training two hours a day to play in the World Cup. I'm going to do it too. And then you get out there. I'm honestly by myself, Jeff. And, and, and I have a ball. I have a wall. And I'm like, okay, now what? I, I have no idea what to work on. I've got <laughs> zero idea of what to work on. So, so I start my – well, I know I'm right-footed, so I should probably work on my left foot. So I start working on my left foot. And at that moment, I realized I wasn't as good at this game as I thought I was. Yeah. And it, I was embarrassed. Imagine being embarrassed when nobody's, nobody's watching you. You're alone and you're embarrassed. That's how bad my embarrassment was. The shame was deep. And so after 10 minutes, I was like, to hell with this. I'm going to go home and play video games with my friends because that's a whole lot easier than having to face up to the fact that I'm not as good at this game as I thought I was. But to my credit, I went back out there the next day. And again, it was 10 minutes and I was super frustrated because you have to, again, you have to accept the fact that you're not good. But because I kept pushing myself out there, I could see that those little things that I was doing, that comfort level, even playing the ball up against the wall, when, you, when I was at practice with my teammates – all of a sudden, when balls came to me, I was a little bit more relaxed. Like, I wasn't as panicked. I wasn't, there was no anxiety with the ball. I was like, oh, well, I've already done this 100 times, even though I suck at it. At least I'm getting comfortable with how the ball is coming to me and what I want to do with it when it does come to me. And all of a sudden, and here's the drug, here's the, here's the thing. When you realize that you're getting a little bit better than everybody else, just a little bit, that 10 minutes turns into 20. And that 20 turns into 40 and then an hour. And then my mom's looking for me because it's getting dark and she doesn't know where I am because I'm out there playing. And then you start to develop little games. And then what's interesting is, and this is important too, because we all take feedback pretty personally, right? We get really sensitive to feedback. I actually was now looking for feedback from my coach. I'd be like, hey, coach, what do I need to work on? And if he had told me the year before, hey, man, your left foot's not very good and you're not doing X, Y, and Z very well. I'd be like, oh, man, I'm not a very good player. My head would go down. I'd be sad. But now I had a process to work through this information. So he would say, hey, you need to work on this, this, and this. And I'd be like, that is unbelievable. Thank you so much for this information. And I'd go and work, find out a game of how I could work on it to make sure I could be better. Because I didn't want any – I wanted all my weaknesses to not be weaknesses anymore. And, and I needed that information, some good, critical, honest information for my coaches to give me that, for me to actually grow as a player. And so as you start to learn all that, you say, okay, that's just with the ball. What if I started lifting? What if I started running? What if I started watching more games? And, and all of a sudden, it just starts to pile up, and you're laying brick by brick, as they say, ladrillo por ladrillo for my Spanish friends. And you start to lay this really important foundation for how you're going to work through adversity moving forward, and that's what I did. Beautifully said. I can't help but note for myself uh, with my orientation that you had to go through a little crossroads of your own shame and your own pain. And one of the questions I had about developing into a, an athlete who was able to play at a professional level is working with emotions, learning to work with emotions, because that seemed to be a differentiator um, to success in dealing with adversity. And so I could see that first uh, ability you know, just to break it down in the language that I speak around stress is that uh, mastery comes when we can break things down and build control, right? When, <laughs> when we're overwhelmed and we have no skill and we have no know-how, but part of going towards learning is obviously facing the uncomfortable emotion. So as you progressed into your, into your athletic life, um, what did you learn about dealing with your own emotional self? It's like anger, joy, motivation, enthusiasm. Where did it get passed you and you lost it and you had to learn forgiveness like how did you develop that particular <laughs> um side of your 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 skill set if you talk to my wife i don't think she's <laughs> thinks i've i've dealt with any of these very very well because she gets to see all the raw emotion that i keep guarded when you're in a professional environment because you don't want to show weakness in a professional environment now i did have outbursts of anger and and frustration which ultimately was tied into expectations versus reality you know, um, where I wanted to go and, and was I ready or was I that person yet? I didn't get called into the national team till I was 28. And that's really late to get your first crack with the national team in any country. Usually if you've got a little bit of talent, a little bit of spark, they're looking at you in 19, 20, 21. They want to see maybe you can, you can compete in the, the Olympic team and, and you have to be under 23 in most, in most competitions or at least in soccer to, to do that. And uh, the guys that were on those Olympic teams and stuff, I, I, I knew I could compete with them, but I just I couldn't get out of my own way in a lot of different ways. So when you're talking about controlling emotions, I think that was part of it was as I got older and I played center back. So I played a, as a defender 
And that's a really important part of the field because you can see the whole field. You can see everybody in front of you. So you have to put out fires before they start. You have to communicate and put guys in good spots to make plays to make the game easier, not just for you, but for everybody. Imagine if I'm behind you and I say slide left and all of a sudden you cut out a pass because I put you in a good spot to make a play. Now your trust of what I'm saying has ratcheted up by 100 because you're like, all right, this guy knows what he's doing. And, and now I'm doing less running, which is what I want to do. Nobody wants to run. <laughs> I mean, you'll do it because that's what the game necessitates. But, it, it, you know, if you could do it more efficiently, I think everybody would be big fans of that. So that was really my thing. And when I made the jump, and I'll talk about this in particular, because I think when I was younger, if I made a mistake in a game, even as a young professional, you could see, you could physically see I was rattled for – the next five minutes. Like I just couldn't get over it. I made a bad pass. It went out of bounds. The fans are heckling you and you start to absorb that in a really, you know, Oh, you suck Conrad or whatever it is. And you, it hurts you, you know, as someone that for me was a bit of a people pleaser and still am to a certain degree, I didn't have the necessary tools to deal with that immediate criticism of a bad pass. Like they don't necessarily teach you how to do that. So that was a learning curve and, and learning how to get thicker skin and actually, I'll say that I went on loan to a team in Poland. And uh, in my, that was, I was my second year in the league. At the end of my second year, I was with the San Jose Earthquakes and MLS. And we were terrible. The worst team in the league. Now, now you're going to be like, oh, why do we have this guy on? He's like, he's a loser. But listen, <laughs> 2001, we won the title. We turned it around and won it in 2001. But, but in between, there was a couple months that we had off. So one of my player, one of my teammates was Polish. And he was going on loan to Lech Poznan which was struggling at the moment, but pretty good team overall in Poland. And uh, for all you soccer geeks out there, Robert Lewandowski ended up playing there as well. He's one of the top strikers in the world for Bayern Munich now and for Poland. But whatever, that's something different. So so I'm just trying to say how cool I was when I went to Lech Posen. Or I'm trying to give context here. <laughs> but when I went over there, they, they it was a really important moment in my life. I went for four months. And what you learned right away is they don't think Americans can play. Yeah. And the guys on your own team don't like you because you're going to take a spot from one of their friends. Uh, you don't know the language. You don't know the culture. And, and you're by yourself. I mean, yes, I had that Polish teammate come with me, but he can speak Polish. Like, he's cruel. You know, he's like seeing all of his old friends. He can immerse into the culture immediately. And I, even though we lived together, after a while, like, you don't want to hang out with the same guy all the time. So he'd go hang out with his people. And I'd just go wander around Poznan and and go to internet cafes which were a thing back then and uh and write long emails back home because i was i was missing home and uh prior to this my stepdad who i'd lived with since i was age three had passed away to melanoma cancer at age 43 so so i that was a couple months after that so there was a lot that i was working through on an individual level but from a playing perspective not only did my team not respect me uh, obviously, the opponents didn't. So I would get punched. I'd get elbowed in the face. I would get stepped on. I'd get spit on. I would get all types of different stuff. And I didn't have anybody. It was just me. Not that my teammates weren't going to support me, but they didn't necessarily care. Uh, they weren't going to have my back. They're like, yeah, we kind of feel the same way. Thanks for spitting on them. You know what I mean? So, so I had to work through that. Yeah. And, and when I left my last game, they gave me a standing ovation. Because I earned, I played 14 games and I earned their respect. And I went from wanting to be spit on to people giving me high fives and showing me that respect. And it was really important for me. I got tougher. And so when I came back from that, I was a different player. And, and, and I was starting to set myself up for learning how to survive in a professional environment. And part of that is controlling your emotions. So <laughs> I did, I will say though, I hadn't punched anybody in the face in the game before prior to going to Poland. But I was also going to stand up for myself, and I had to learn how to protect myself out there as well. And with regard to it, now I'll go back to the national team example I was going to use. When I made the jump to the national team, I couldn't be – I couldn't show or demonstrate emotional weakness. I couldn't let anybody know that I was rattled at any point, whether it was my teammates. right? We're all competing to try to play for the national team, to go represent our country at the World Cup. Like that, you can't let anybody see that you have a crack, that you're vulnerable – and so I had to sh save that for my phone calls with my wife or my support system, my, my parents or whoever else, my ex-coaches who were still involved and would talk to me about this type of stuff. But then, so what I would do, here's my trick. Anytime I made a bad pass or something happened and I made a mistake, instead of like physically 
having a reaction fa- with my face or with my body language, I would immediately start organizing people. So it's funny. If you ever watch an old national team game with me and there's a mistake, and everybody makes mistakes in the game, so it's not like I'm, it's isolated to me. But if I made a mistake that I was disappointed in or me being able to hit like maybe a long ball, I didn't hit it as hard as I wanted and it got cut out, whatever, then – I would, you could see me when I was younger, like my, sh- my shoulders would slump and my head would go down and it was clearly rattling me. There, the national team, I, I don't have, nobody, we don't have time for this. Nobody has time for your feelings right now. So you just got to move on to the next play because the game's moving so quick at that level. You got to move on to the next play. So I would just start organizing people. Hey, get here, get there, get there. And I just, it would not only help me put out the perception that shit happens, but it also, for me, helped me personally move on. Like it, I don't care about my feelings right now. We have to concentrate on the next play and not let emotion sink you for the next play or the two plays after that because you're being a baby about a bad pass. So so there were little things that I did and little moments of experience in my life. And I gave that Poland example as one where I think that helped kind of lay the foundation for me when the moment came and when I had to step up and play in a World Cup with millions of people watching, I was ready when that opportunity came. I guess I was expecting in your answer a little bit more of I get the control and the on-field and the responsibility you have to not let your emotions uh, distort your capacity for play. Or, yeah. But I also feel I, I would imagine that you also had to work with the voices in your head and train yourself to deal with disappointment or feeling anger or those other things and yeah. that come along with adversity. So I get I get the professional side. I'm wondering about the personal side. And I hear a little bit of like you had to bifurcate. You're like, hey, man, no vulnerability out here. I go to Poland. I learn how to deal with pain. I'm unimaginable <laughs> isolation and pain. And I realize I can. So that kind of sets me up for, you know, being able to go to the World Cup and, and be in those high pressure cook situations. I know. Situations. I probably skipped a couple steps there. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's okay to skip steps. and uh, But I did want to like circle back to your personal development, right? in relationship to understanding your emotions, using your emotions both for good and for, I don't know, growing. I, one of the main things I know about stress, for sure, is that when we can exercise the right amount of control, it's helpful for us. Because once we start taking action, we move out of like, I'm just, I'm just a passive participant and whatever happens to, happens to me, right? But as soon as we can initiate some kind of contribution, we exert our influence, all of a sudden we're transforming the situation. Super healthy, super vital. I definitely hear that in your story, um, but I'll, I'll just lay that out there for you to respond to. Yeah, so I love that. Yeah, it, there, there's a lot there. And I'm, I, I guess it's easy for me. Yeah, I played in the World Cup, but I think there's a lot to unpack with regard to how you put yourself in a position to even make the team, let alone perform at the highest level when everybody's watching. I will say that with regard to control, yeah, I was having a tough time. So this is probably around the same year, or actually maybe the year after Poland, the next season in 2001, which we ended up winning. And I broke my foot in preseason, I was slated to be the starter and I broke my foot. So I was out 10 weeks. Now the silver lining of that is that was, that's where I reconnected with my wife and we've talked every day since that, (laughs) since I broke my foot and went down to LA and I went to college with her. And so that, that's the silver lining of that. But, but I was heartbroken from a professional standpoint because I was slated to play at center back, my best position. And when I got back into the team, the team was on a 17 game unbeaten streak there's no way I'm going to get back into the team. And I was frustrated because I knew that I had the, the qualities and capabilities to get in, but I had to sit and watch until there was a reason. And when I got back on the field, it was at right back where I, my skill set is okay. I can, I can do the job defensively, but going forward isn't really, you know, I'm not really the complete player in that area, but the center back I was so that, but that's the only area I could get into the team. So I was like, all right, well, that's where I'm going for Cause the other two center backs were, were very, very good. And Troy Dyack and Jeff Agus. So shout out to those two. So what I ended up doing in 2001 was, and I was really frustrated, was I would start writing down what I wanted to accomplish from that day. Uh, and, and okay, because because I would I would for anybody that plays any sport, nothing frustrates you more, no matter what level, when you do something that gives the team the other ball cheaply. You know, if you're playing tennis, you just you kind of hit a wayward forehand or, you know, golf. Unforced errors, just, yeah, on tennis. Unforced errors. Yeah. Oh, my God, it's the worst, <laughs> right? And you just and, – and then they start to compound. Yeah. And now you can't get out of your own way. 
And I'm getting my coaching licenses in this country. I've got my B. I'm working on my A so I can coach uh, pros at the highest, highest levels. And, and one of the things that I really want to focus on, I actually want to get your thoughts on, on this, is how do you regain confidence when you don't have any? How, that's individually. Collectively, how does your team regain momentum when you don't have any? That's a collective one. So, so these are the things that I'm trying to explore because it's the mental side of the game. But what do you refer back to to get you back into those spaces so you can regain confidence? Because you see it at, at any level, right? You can see the best team in the world in any sport taking on maybe not the worst team but not as good. And that, that not as good team is still going to probably control the tempo for five or ten minutes. That's just how it works in, in for a half or whatever for part of the game. And it's just the weirdest thing because the other team backs off, the good team does, or whatever. So how do you maintain that kind of intensity and focus that you need to have to kind of see a team out, especially if you're better than them on paper? And, and I love all that type of stuff, and I love breaking that down. So we can explore that later. But, but that's from kind of my next phase, and I think it, it's something I learned when I was playing is, okay – Things aren't going my way right now. How can I figure out how to get that? I can put the work in, and that's clear. I, I did that my whole career. I would go, you know, I needed to work on my first touch. I found a tennis ball machine and shot tennis balls at my feet so I could get better, like I have a softer first touch. I needed to work on kind of playing quicker in tight spaces. I went into a racquetball court and, and worked with a tennis ball, worked with a soccer ball just to try to just, – just to get my – touch my uh, – Create muscle memory that made me play a little bit quicker. Keep my head up when I was playing. All these little things, right? Creating some, just giving myself that base that I can be even better than I am now. And, and, but that was on the physical side. It felt very physical, technical, somewhat tactical, but it wasn't, okay, what if you, let me say it like this. What's really frustrating is you put all that extra work in. You're doing all these little things behind the scenes, and yet things still aren't going well for you. You're still turning the ball over at practice. And what's frustrating is you think that you deserve to not make mistakes because you are putting this time in. And that is a hard thing to accept. You're like, well, I'm doing all this work. I should be perfect. perfect perfection doesn't exist, but you can, you can try to strive for it. But, but you're trying to be perfect, and it just doesn't work that way. So that was a hard thing for me to grasp as well, that I'm doing all these extra things. Why aren't things going my way? And how did and you so grasp start, it? Yeah, how did you grasp that? You so I started writing down goals. Uh -huh. And I started to really focus on, hey, today, I'm, in, in these situations, I'm going to play two-touch. In these situations, if I have time, then maybe I'll pick up my head. I started to really – I knew what was coming at practice because at this point, I couldn't get into the team with San Jose in 2001. So at practice, I had to figure out ways to have success that was driven – that had, I had control over. That wasn't at the whim of the coach or the whim of a teammate or whatever. It was just, this is, I know, this is the drills I know we're doing today. Even if it's as simple as a passing drill, how clean can I be with my passes? How precise can I be with my pass? I started to hold myself to, to those types of standards, but, but very specific in a way that I could control those standards. And it wasn't feeling so out of, out of hand. And, and that allowed me to really kind of rope in. And, and at the end of each drill, I would judge myself. And not to the point where I had to make 10 out of 10 passes, but just were 9 out of 10 good? And that one that I missed, what could I have done different, right? You start to evaluate yourself in a way that's, I think, constructive as opposed to being destructive. Because if you didn't have that framework in place, you would just, you'd just be kind of flying in the wind without a plan. Because now I'd go back and be like, oh, man, I got 8 out of 10 passes today. Cool. All right, I got some room to go. What did I do in those two? And you start to work through and then that actually helps inform you in terms of what you should be working on when nobody's watching in the racquetball court, the tennis ball machine. You're like, okay, cool. I need to work on these three things. And it becomes very clear. Now, because to what you said, because you have a plan, it's so much easier for you to, to work through the stress and anxiety because you're really kind of keeping things uh, under control, but also in, in your grasp. You know, you're not, you're not – like I couldn't have been a rookie in MLS going, I wanna, I'm going to play for the national team one day. That's, a, that's an overall goal, but man, all the little things you have to do to get to that point is, is what you kind of have to focus on, and you have to take it step by step, and, and that's what I ended up doing, and I stuck with that for many, many years until I didn't need it anymore, uh -huh. and I kind of, I, I had it. You know, I knew what I needed to do. I could evaluate myself in real time. I didn't write down the individual stuff or the day-by-day -day stuff anymore. When did you arrive at the point where you just trusted yourself and you had that confidence? Uh, 2000, 2004, mm -hmm. because I got traded to Kansas City, and uh, 
we played a back three, and I and I know we don't want to get soccer. No, geeky, you can go there. A, go there, yeah. When you're in a back three in the defense, I play it either right or left. The guy in the middle is the one that has all the fun because he's actually the one pulling the strings and organizing everybody. But if you're on the right or the left, you're just marking another dude and you're just doing grunt work. You're like, yeah, I just follow that guy around the whole time. And I never thought that I got to use my brain. I was just reactive. I wasn't really anticipatory. It was just me versus this guy and can I be better than him? And I'm fine at that, but I thought I had more to offer. I thought I was more cerebral in terms of putting people in good spots and being organized and all that. Now, the guy that won the league MVP that year for Kansas City, Precky, we played a back three to accommodate him because he plays no defense. The guy's a, ma- a magician on the ball, and he deserved the league MVP. But in 2004, in preseason, he broke his leg, and it was the most disgusting thing ever, and uh, he never recovered from it. And he had to retire. I mean, he's 36 at that point, so he was close to it anyway. But once he dropped out, we went back to a back four, and I got to play in the middle, and then my career just took off. And I think at that point, that's where I didn't need it anymore. I knew exactly who I wanted to be. I knew exactly how I wanted to play. I knew exactly how I wanted my team to move in front of me. And I finally had the opportunity to know that I could play that for a long time. And 2004 is where I, I got MLS All-Star for the first time, MLS Best 11. I won MLS Defender of the Year the next year. Sweet. And I started going to the national team. I played in the World Cup in 06. Yeah, like let's, just, talk, let's talk about the World Cup. My career Cup. just took off from there. That's beautiful. And I do want to talk about the World Cup um, as a kind of, I would say, probably maybe one of the peak moments, or that was the the peak of your... Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah so yeah. tell me tell me a little bit about it. I, I, I went back and I watched a little bit of footage. I watched the highlights. I saw where you got subbed in and the game against Italy and the red the three red cards mm-hmm. there. Um, and I, I, I watched the goals that were given up in the game against Ghana, which was a pivotal game there in the group stage. And I imagine, like, I'm like, okay, this is his first full game at a group stage in the World Cup. You could, you beat Ghana, you go through, and then you get those two goals against you that seem rather unfair um, as I looked at them, you know, 18 yeah, years yeah. later. Yeah, I'm still bitter about them. Thanks for bringing it up. Uh, <laughs> no. So, so what was interesting was getting named to the team was, at that point, my peak accomplishment. I, I was, again, the little engine that could. I had no, on paper, I had no right to be there. I mean, if you look back on it. But, but I mean, worked me, and I fought. Yeah, I want to slow you down a little bit um, here sure. just for a second because you go, fast, you, have, so you have so much energy. But I want to appreciate your resilience. I, so here you are, the little engine that could, your metaphor for that. But I just hear, you know, from, you know, San Diego State to UCLA, not getting drafted, you know, each of these things, the injury to the foot, each of these things, I just really see a kind of um, a fight and a resilience. And I would probably tie it back to what you said at the outset of the pot- podcast around your own personal creating value for your life as a kind of thank you to your parents and, and, and a way, way into the world. So I just, I want to appreciate that as you get onto the roster for, to represent a whole country going to Germany for people who don't know, 2006 world cup was in Germany and you know, you get to go with that group of Americans who get to go and play in the biggest tournament in the world um, for your country. Yeah. So what's interesting is, and I appreciate the, the compliment of resilience. Uh, that means a lot. There were 30 pundits in the States that tried to predict the lineup or the, the 23 man roster that was going to go to, to Germany in 2006. And only one of 30 pundits had me in their 23 man roster. And coincidentally, the one pundit was Marcelo Balboa, who had turned into a pundit <laughs> just to tie that back in the one player that I tried to emulate back in the day after hearing from his dad, Wow, which is the most incredible twist of fate. I'm friends with him. I used to have a poster of him in my room. So it still feels very surreal for me to, to be able to say that out loud and that he actually picked me and then also to be a friend of his now. So, so with regard to Marcelo picking me, we actually had a conversation after the roster came out and he's like, I knew you were in, you were a lock because you fit what is needed for a team. You don't get down when you're not starting. You don't make it all about you. You don't have any attitude. You just go out and do your job, and they can use you in any situation, and you're going to be up for it. He's like, for me, it was a no-brainer, especially given how well you've been playing recently. I was like, love you, Marcelo Balboa. <laughs> so, 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 but I, he was right, and the coaching staff felt the same way. So I didn't get to play in the first game against Czech Republic. Now, I should give some context for 2006. In 2002, that's when we made our run in the quarterfinals when it was in South Korea and Japan. And we lost to Germany in the quarterfinals there when we shouldn't have lost, actually. We should have won that game. Probably our best game that we had played, and we played a lot of great games. So there's a lot of hype around our program at that point. So coming into 2006, 
we cruised through qualifying. We had won the Gold Cup, which is our regional tournament the year before. And and we just were playing well against our friendlies, no problem. We and so they have FIFA rankings. Now, for people that know these, they're a little loose. I don't know what they're really determined on sometimes, but we were number three in the world going into the 2006 World Cup, which was a bit inflated. And I think that added a little bit of pressure, not only the expectations of trying to build on the quarterfinals of 2002, but also this now inflated FIFA ranking. Thank you, FIFA, for putting that pressure on us. <laughs> and we were in the group of death. So we had Czech Republic, we had Ghana, and we had uh, Italy, who ended up winning the tournament in 2006. So I didn't start against Czech Republic. I didn't expect to start. But I had a pretty good pre, pre-World Cup. Like, it's funny because you get named to the team, and then you have a month before you go into the camp. And, and you're like, I just don't want to get hurt in this month. So you're like tap dancing around your club team practice and stuff. Super funny. Then you go into camp, and they start putting you through like the hardest fitness test you've ever been in your whole entire life. And you survive those, and then finally you get to Germany, where the, you get to feel like you can relax and party and just kind of focus on the tournament itself. So we play Czech Republic first. I've never seen a national team play as well as they did. They were up for us. They were ready to go tactically. They were superior. They made the plays. We lost 3-0. And second half, we'd already made two subs. There's only one sub left, and it's me, Clint Dempsey, and Josh Wolf. And Clint, obviously a legend for the U.S. Josh Wolf is now coaching Austin FC, my roommate. And we're one of the last – one of us is going to go in for the last sub. And I'm running. I'm going, like, this Czech Repu- – I'm thinking to myself, this Czech Republic team is – it's pretty good, man. I don't know. Do I want this to be my first World Cup appearance? Like, this team is rolling <laughs> us over. And Clint Dempsey, you know, he's chomping at the bit to get his first World Cup experience as well. And they ended up putting Josh in because we needed an attacking player. And I was kind of like, kind of relieved because those guys were, were just, they were another level. Uh, I obviously would have gone in and enjoyed it. But I, and I was prepared for it. But all, I watched the highlights. All those goals were fantastic. They all, they oh, all three so just excellent goals. Bangers, bangers. Yeah, all of them. We, we had we had one chance at 1-0 where Claudio Reyna hit it and it hit the post, but we really didn't threaten, and Czech Republic fully deserved that result. But it put a lot of pressure on us afterwards. And I remember after the game, here's a fun insight for you. Yeah, thank you. Which I think you'll find fascinating. After the game, in the locker room, there it was hot. People were upset, and, and rightfully upset. We just we got outcoached. We got outplayed. Nothing worked for us. We couldn't solve any problems. It was one of those types of games. Which goes and back can, to your question, just to present that question again, because it's a good question. What do you do when you don't have confidence? So, Yes, and how do you regain it? Especially because there's five days between each game in the World Cup, in the group stage. So now you've got five days to sit with this. Now, before I get into kind of what I did after that game, there was a press conference happening at the same time. And Bruce Arena, our coach, threw a couple players under the bus, which we were unaware of because we weren't in the press conference. And he threw Landon Donovan and Demarcus Beasley under the bus for not performing at the level that they had been playing at, even in the 2002 World Cup, which is something Bruce never does. He always protects the players. And he ended up apologizing to us once we got back to our hotel in Hamburg. We flew home because we were Hamburg was our base. We flew back, and he pulled us in right away after landing because he thought that I think some of us heard it. Maybe some of the other players did. I didn't play, so I wasn't getting thrown under the bus per se. But he apologized. And I, as we were walking out, I'm now taken into consideration, I've only really been with the national team for about a year at this point. These other guys have been around for like five years with Bruce. And so they said, hey, he's never, never one, thrown anybody under the bus player-wise individually before. And second, he's never apologized for something like that either. So there was already kind of a weird vibe going around with the team, but, but that was something that was happening collectively. Now on an individual level, the, the locker room, it didn't, it didn't, nobody was saying anything toxic, but it felt toxic, right? Everybody, when you're there and you don't play well, everybody's looking for a a shoulder to cry on or like somebody to validate, Hey, you played. Okay. It's that other guy kind of thing, right? That's, that's normal. That is, that is a human, normal human emotion of things not going your way and you trying to process what that means and, and, the things that you have to address yourself and also the questions you're going to get from the people that, that love you and, and all obviously the public criticism as well. I'm going to pause you. Go ahead. Yeah, Do so, it. Sorry. I want to pause you because I think that's a good teaching moment. What's the cycle of you know something doesn't go well before we get back into the rest of the story? Mm-hmm. But that cycle right there where somebody's looking for a shoulder to cry on or trying to feel good before you land to the reality of like, oh, yeah, it was me. I, I did blow it or we did blow it. And what? How long a cycle is that? Is that is that forty eight hours? Is that twelve hours? What is that for you? I, I I think it depends. If you're talking collectively, 
I think that depends on the culture of the team okay. and how quickly your coach and your leaders of your team, the captains of the team, or they don't always have to have the captain's armband up to be a leader, but how quickly they can process. Is it fair to say that more successful and the healthier cultures get to that resolution quicker? Yes. And I, well, yes and no. Yes, in some capacity, because I think they're ready to just focus on what's ahead of them because that's all they can control at this point. But I think that there is some value in addressing some of the things that did happen a couple days later and maybe revisiting some of that pain so that you can maybe actually move past it in a more meaningful way, whether you're watching videotape, right, or highlight in certain play, even if it's going to potentially trigger one of the players to feel bad about themselves all over again when they maybe have already worked past it. So you have to kind of know your group collectively. Individually, it depends on what I did in the game, <laughs> what I did it. Like if I was one of the players that made a mistake that cost us a goal – that would probably take me a little bit longer to 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 get over than it than if I had played well, but the team still lost. Got it. Thing. Okay, so um, you were so, back so, out of Bruce. He apologizes. No, no, no. So, so I kind of fast forwarded there, but let's go back to the locker room. So we're in the locker room, and it just felt like we had a team that was angry, and it was really hard as someone who didn't play just to kind of sit there and slowly take off your shin guards and your cleats and all this stuff and just and have to absorb all that energy. I was like, I am I'm out of here. So I said to the fitness coach, for the guys that didn't play, let's get them out of here. Let's go grab some balls. I'm the, I just I initiated it. I grabbed the ball cuz everybody was kind of shell shocked cuz we had high hopes obviously coming into this one. And when you don't it, percentage wise, if you don't win your first group stage game in the World Cup, it makes it very very difficult for you to to qualify. So so we knew and especially we lost 3-0 it made it even harder because now we had a goal difference to work, work past as well. So we would have to beat somebody 3-0 to kind of get back on level terms, which was going to be hard against Italy and Ghana in our next two games. So, so there was already kind of that surrounding it and swirling around. Again, not a lot of it verbalized, but you could feel it. And, and I think, and maybe I read into some of these feelings at times, which maybe have worked against me when I was a younger gentleman trying to date girls and figure out, do they really like me? Do they not? We can get into that later. But, but – but I had a feeling, and I'm like, I'm not sitting in this atmosphere. I'm just not going to do it. I need to do something. I need to get out my own energy about this whole situation. And so I went, and I grabbed the guys that didn't play, and I grabbed a bag of balls, and like, let's just go out there. And I, then I went up to the fitness coach, and I said, let's just get out there. Run us through something for 30 minutes, man. So we went back out to the field, and there was all the guys. I think all the guys ended up, whether they wanted to or not, they ended up feeling guilted. I peer pressured them into coming back out, which I think was for the best for everybody. So the guys that played can actually work through their stuff, and the guys that didn't can be out of their way, and we can get out and, and expend some energy. So it was me, Clint Dempsey, all the guys. Uh, ben Olsen, we're all out there sprinting, doing some sprints, doing some ball work, doing some possession. And there were still some U.S. fans in the stands, and one of them was my friend. So he remembers me going out there and doing that. And it was really, I think, important for us as that group, that separate group of non guys that didn't play to also have room for us to process what happened. Because when you don't play and the team doesn't play well, you always insert yourself into the conversation of, well, if I had been out there, not to say we would have won, but maybe I could have impacted the game in a way that kept it closer or whatever it may be. Yeah. So, uh, well, so, also so you're I going... was actually pretty proud of myself that I initiated that. No, it's a really good move, and there's, a, there's, you know, there's science that can explain that, but the, the, the more simple way of talking about it is you know, you're going through all the emotions, but you don't get to move your body <laughs> you know, of all yeah, the yeah, stress, yeah. right? So it's all built up, and everybody else had at least a chance who was on the field to move some of that energy and and this is why when it comes to stress or why control is actually you know it's frowned upon the ego tends to be frowned upon we talk about controlling in all these negative ways but i've worked at rephrasing it as like positive influence or creative influence in our environment you can't take an organism in any part of the world any aspect of the living sphere and not let it have a way to exert influence on its environment and expect it to do okay. So, you know, being there on, on, on waiting and watching and then using the body is so functional. And I think that's the best side of control is where we actually express our, our, our evolved or our God given energy in order to influence our environment in ways that we can feel good about. So that's a, no, that, that. that's a beautiful story. No, thank you. Uh, let's move on to the next game then. Cause I think you'll like this one as well. Great. So we're playing Italy and we need to get a result, right? You lose your first two group stage games, you're out. There's no way you're going to qualify for the next round. So we need to do something. Yeah. And uh, we end up, it's 1-1, one, one, it, It's one one, and then Italy gets a red card. So we're up a man. At this point, right? You're up a man. 
you got about eh, 60 minutes to go, 50, 50 minutes to go. You're thinking, wow, we've got ourselves a good chance. Now, keep in mind that the Italians are known for being difficult to break down, whether they got 11 players or 10 yeah. or 9, doesn't matter. A very defensive so, country, very defensive oh, very, soccer. Very, very, the yep. Catanaccio, it's called for all you soccer geeks out there. And uh, they, we, uh, Pablo Mastriani, one of my teammates, has a rush of blood to the head, tries to make a tough tackle, gets a red card in that game. So now at halftime, it's 1-1, and now it's even, 10 versus 10. So I go into halftime thinking, okay, I need to be prepared for any eventuality. I can try to see myself maybe going in with 10 minutes left to hold on to the tie or, or maybe hold on to a lead. I wouldn't come in, obviously, if we're down. We're going to bring in attacking players, but, but I want to make sure I'm prepared. And what's interesting about being a sub is that you eat your pregame meal at the same time as all the other guys, the guys that start. But by halftime, dude, you are hungry. You are a hungry, hungry hippo at that point because, because you, you haven't expended the same energy. Your body hasn't turned on in that same way. And you are hungry. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to eat this Gatorade bar. And I'm gonna, I house this Gatorade bar thinking, okay, I might get in. And if I do, this will give me a little bit, hopefully, of that little boost. So right after halftime, Eddie Pope, who I love dearly, plays center back, my position, who I looked up to for many years, he... He gets his second yellow. Now, the referee, I don't think, realized that he'd already given him a yellow. And by the time he did and looked at his book, he knew he had to throw him out. I honestly believe that the referee knew he had given him a yellow. He wouldn't have given him a second. But he did give him a second. So we're talking two minutes after halftime. Eddie Pope gets his second yellow. He's out. So now it's 10 versus 9 to the Italians. And at this point, Bobby Condi has to come out. And Bruce Arena and, and Glenn Meyernick, rest in peace to Glenn, he, he, they turned to me like, Jimmy, you've got to warm up. And I was like, what is happening? What is going? This is awesome. I didn't even need to warm up. I was like, well, I went from zero to a thousand. I, I, my blood has never got that, that. I mean, I was so excited. And, uh, and I wasn't overwhelmed. I was actually at peace with everything. And, and, and mainly because I think the situation dictated it. I, I needed to be calm. And because of the situation, we're down a man and all this stuff. But, also because we weren't supposed to win in that situation. I didn't go into a, a, a spot where they needed me to be anything other than what I was. And, and, and just a good, hard-nosed defender that put guys in good spots to make plays and just see the game out. I didn't need to go score the winning goal. Like I didn't have that type of pressure on my back. And I think that helped me relax. Also, when the ball went out of bounds... I was told before by Clive Charles, a legendary coach here who also passed away. Rest in peace to Clive. He, he said to us before we left to go to Germany on a video conference call, he wanted to talk to us as a team because he was sick at the time with cancer. And he said, just if you get on the field, take one moment to smell the grass, look around, just make that, that moment as vivid as possible because you'll never forget it. And so I did that. The ball went out of bounds or somebody got hurt. And I had like, you know, you have a couple minutes while the, the team's coming out. The trainers are coming out to look at the injured player. And I looked around and I did all that. I smelled the grass. It's still as vivid to me as it was back then. And I'm glad that, that he said that because I, I'm glad I took that moment. But I remember thinking also in that moment, this is the most glorified men's league game of all time. It's just, it's just a normal like Sunday league game with my friends, with the millions of people watching and tons of pressure. And, and for whatever reason, that completely relaxed me. Yeah. Thinking about it in those terms, yeah. I, just, I, just, I was just in the moment. And I, I came out of that game, people raving about how well I played, especially coming in in that situation. Mm -hmm. And, and I am going to get geeky here for you because this is my, prou my proudest thing about this, this game Great. is that when you're in the back line, it's very easy to sit on top of your box and just absorb pressure, especially if you're in the situation that we were in. But I made sure that we didn't, that we kept our spacing a little bit higher so that it gave us a chance to maybe hit them on the counterattack or on the break, right? Because we have very – DeMarcus Beasley, Landon Donovan, we got guys Speedy. that can do it. yeah. We got them offside seven times, I believe, after I came in, which is, a, which is pretty remarkable to, to hold a team of that caliber to seven offsides in one half. And that made me proud because that was what I was very good at. That's organizing, that's putting guys in good spots, and that's mm. being super disciplined mm. in, in your team spacing. Mm. And that will never show up on a box score. Right. But for me, that is something I take a great deal of pride in because I came into a very difficult situation and not necessarily made it look easy, but, but made sure that we maintained our integrity as a team. And we ended up getting the one, one result, which was very cool. It's beautiful, too, because it ties back to everything we've been talking about 
so far around control, influence, organization, where your spot was, you know, and here you are put into an untenable circumstance and you were able to achieve something that nobody would know. That's but true. You, I, I, don't th- I don't think I thought about it that way, but you're right. You know, you did. You were able to achieve something that no one else would know, but you knew. And it was a, almost like, I don't use the word per- perfect because I know that perfection is a, th- a thing you talk about at different times as a, as a struggle, but a kind of perfect moment of coalescing there in that place, in that really special Sunday league game. <laughs> that was a, yeah, that's a funny, a really image. magnified. Totally. I, honestly, it was such a great way for me to be like, "Hey, man, this is a glorified." Yeah, and Wednesday I have all these game. things just, I want to re- just, just relax, just relax, you know? totally. Just play, and, and just because have fun. You, Enjoy we it. know what happens when we uh, increase it the opposite way when we make it too big, right? When we make it too big for the moment, we become small, and the it's harder to play well. That's my experience. I mean, I've never played anywhere close to the levels you have, but we get it. So I appreciate all that, but I also what also I love is that 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 one point you got by holding Italy to a draw to a tie puts you in a position where you could maybe actually make it out of the group stage, and then you got to start in the last game of the of that group stage of the World Cup, right? So it also gave the team some hope. So what happened in the locker room there in terms of the team spirit after that, you know, unimaginable it, situation? Oh, uh, it was great. It was great. I ended up trading jerseys with somebody I looked up to from Italy, Andrea Pirlo. What was also cool was that Italy and the Italian national team, the coaching staff, like some some legendary players and coaches were so in awe of our our fight, like our spine that the they were so impressed with our performance to fight back and hold them off in those circumstances that when I traveled to Italy, this like 15 years later, they still remember, like, they're oh, you were part of the U.S. team in 2006? They love that team for whatever reason. So I got treated with a great deal of respect. Shout out to the Italians for that. But, but after the game, we just felt like we, in some ways, redeemed ourselves, to borrow that quote from, from Dumb and Dumber. Totally redeemed ourselves. So that, to your point, gave us a chance in that last game, which is all you really want, is you want to have a, an opportunity to, to see through all three group stage games with a chance to get into the knockout rounds. And what's interesting is the vibe was better, the energy was better, and uh, there was a bounce in our step heading into that Ghana game. And now the competition to see who would play in that game was pretty steep. And now, because I came in and did well, I was most likely going to start, and I knew it. And Pope was out for another game because he got red carded, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. And because I went in and did admirably, I, it was a no-brainer to start me in that game from a coaching perspective. But and this is going to probably won't blow your mind, but, but maybe in some capacity, as I mentioned before, there were five days between games. So, you know, day off the day after against Italy. And then we start to, now we're starting to ramp up again for these games. I maybe trained the worst I've ever trained for the national team. I trained so bad, everybody that the coaching staff pulled me aside and asked me if I was all right, which is like the kiss of death. You never want your coaching staff to pull you aside and be like, are you okay? And that is <laughs> Have terrible. Have partying a little bit too, too I, much like, German beer? <laughs> it, it's not – well, that, they, they knew I didn't do any of that. But, but – well, some players did, but I wasn't one of those. Yeah. They knew who they had. They knew exactly who yeah, that. Okay, I okay. wasn't that. They just knew that I think Jimmy's in his own head, and, mm-hmm. and I was. Yeah. I was, in my, I was in my own head, and I was – I had – think about what I had to do at the Italy game. I was sitting on the bench just finishing up a Gatorade bar and all of a sudden thrown into the fire. I didn't have any time to think. Now I've got five days to think about this game and how I'm going to play and what I'm going to do and, and all the people that are watching and, and my family. Is, is, is my dad going to stay for that? He wasn't going to stay for the, the third game because he had to get back for work. W- would he stay now knowing that I was going to start? Like you start to have these – my dad also didn't like to fly, and he, he, he was there. So like you have all these special – my youth coach, the one I had talked about way before, he was also at that Italy game. Like I had all these, these really important people in my life that had come all this way to support me. And so, okay, now what? Now I'm starting. Are, these, are they going to stick around? Are they going to go home? Even though they had only slated to stay for a week or whatever for the first two games. So you have all these other things that are pulling you and, and you're thinking about in a way that I didn't have time to think about uh, it, with the Italy game. What a challenge that was for me mentally. That was, that was the biggest challenge. And Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah, shoot. Yeah, the question I have is uh, how did you did, like the coaches bring it to your attention? Like how did you work your way through the heavy – you know, not quite head trips, but the mental space you were in, in that spot. Like, what, what'd you do? I, I told the coaches that I'll be fine. That, that I just was honest. Like, I, I'm, I'm nervous. You know, I mean, I, I, I just have a lot of time to think about 
what's going on, but you can trust me. I'll be ready to go when the whistle blows. And so that gets and, into the thing I kind I don't, we're not really going to have time to talk about today, I don't think, but this kind of, you know. The, oh, not, we have a part two? We should do a part two. We I should do wait. a part two on the, <laughs> on the off the field, on the off the field oh, stuff. Because yeah, yeah, this yeah. is all on field stuff. I mean, it's a little bit sure. around the field. I'm interested in, yeah, te- I'm interested in teammates and what happens with the intercompetition and support and all these other things. But here you are, you're at the World Cup. You let the, co- the coaches know you're nervous. Twenty five yeah, minutes ago, you nervous. said it, uh, you don't let you don't let any show you you don't show your crap. Well, so you did. I had well, I hadn't been called out like that, so I guess I had to make a decision, a quick decision about about what. And I knew that I wasn't performing well, and I knew that I was, I, I was, I was hesitating. I wasn't playing. I was thinking too much, you yeah. know. And and it's almost like maybe in some ways I was scared to start that that I didn't want that responsibility that I was too. And I think that's where it came from. That, that before, I didn't make the team as a starter. They didn't see me as a starter. But now they have to uh, trust me as a starter. So yeah. that was something that I maybe hadn't necessarily mentally prepared for, that, that possibility that I could start. When I was kind of comfortable and secure with the fact that I could just be this super sub that comes on and, and holds leads or, or you know, holds a 1-1 draw against Italy or whatever, that's how I built myself in terms of my – I have my reputation within the team or, or my stature, my standing within the team. That was, that was where I was. Yeah, when I had that opportunity, I had more time to think about it. It just was, it was a lot. And, and ultimately, I got to a point where I started watching a ton of video on Ghana. So I knew all of the tendencies, right? We get back to control. I wanted to make sure I knew all the strengths and weaknesses of these players individually and also because of the guys I'm going up directly, but also the guys that are passing them the ball. Where do they like to pass them the ball? Do they like to play it short? Do they like to play it over the top? I tried to give myself every advantage that I possibly could with as much information as possible to ultimately help me relax. And I think what got me there was I didn't want to have this whole, all the sacrifice that I had in my life. And then when my moment came, I shied away from the moment. That, that I, I got to a point where I was super nervous, man. I was when the, when we were lining up and they were doing the national anthems. I mean, as nervous as I've ever been before a game. Obviously, I mean it's the World Cup and everybody's watching. But I got to a point where you, you kind of f it, you know. Like I I I'm gonna do the best that I possibly can, and if it's not good enough, then it's not good enough. But I don't want to be looking back and regretting because I was timid. I, I didn't want to be timid, Jimmy, in this one. I wanted to be all super in. confident, yep. strong, all in, Jimmy. Yep. And, and you can explore any of this part of the game that you want. We had two really bad plays go against us. And, and, it ha- and I'll, I'll get into one of them, but I'll just jump to the end. I had a couple players come up to me, including my roommate, Josh Wolf, who obviously when you have a roommate in these situations, you, you confide in them in a way that you wouldn't with somebody that's not your roommate because you're just around them all the time. But he came up to me after the game and he said, that's the best I've ever seen you play. So, so, and that I take that as the highest compliment that somebody could have paid me. Cause he didn't have to say that, right? He'd never, he didn't have to, he could have said infinite things, but for him to say, that's the best I've ever seen you play really sticks with me. And it's funny how much the, the, the respect and love and adoration you get from your peers actually means more than anything a coach can say or, or anybody else, your parents, like getting that from somebody that's competed and had to sacrifice as much as you and, and shows you that kind of, that gives you that type of compliment is, is the highest uh, praise that I could ever receive. But, but just to kind of fast forward to how I did compete and how I handled myself in that game, yeah. that's the compliment I got at the end. No, that's beautiful. And it sounds like, would you agree that you uh, played one of the best games you ever played in your life that day? Well, what's funny is the first 10 minutes I thought I was a little dicey because we were nervous as a group, and I was nervous too. And I remember Josh's dad after the game going – he, he came up to me because all the parents kind of came back into our hotel and he goes, I was a little unsure of you the first 10 or 15 minutes, you know, <laughs> and, and, and I thought it was an interesting thing for him to say, you know, still kind of the day of the game because it was a day game and not a night game. And, but he was right. I, I, I was still trying to kind of figure out where to establish my presence and, and rhythm in the game. Um, I was making plays, but I was like connecting passes. Was I helping this transition? Was I doing everything I possibly could? to help the team. And at that point, I think I was still thinking individually and not collectively, but I got there. And, uh, and I think it helped in, in some weird way. And this feels terrible to say, but because Claudio Reyna, our captain made a mistake on the first goal where he got kind of coughed up the ball and then they scored. 
it almost took some pressure off of me going, well, shit, it just happened to Claudia Reyna, so I can't get any worse than that if our best player on the ball gets, just gets stripped and they score. I think my big regret is of that game was at halftime. We gave up a – it was the worst penalty kick call I've ever seen in person. Called against us. It was a size advantage thing where a tall player headed a ball over a small player and the small player fell over and they called a penalty. It's ridiculous. It happened two minutes before halftime. They score. And we were so we, – we, we went down 1-0. We came back and made it 1-1. So we kind of had the momentum for the back half of the first half. But then that penalty happened. And it just took all the air out of us at halftime and nobody said anything at halftime. There was really nothing to say because we were still shocked about what had just happened. And how could that have been called a penalty? Like you're still working through all this emotion and pro like, okay, now we had to already fight back from a goal down. Now we have to do it again. We had to win that game to go through. So for us to fight back from one zero to one, one, all right, cool. We get it to one, one at half. We can make some adjustments at halftime. We got 45 minutes to go find that second goal. Now we're down 2-1. Now we got to find two goals against a team we're having a tough time creating chances against, which is going to be a tougher ask. And everybody, it just seemed like we were at a loss for words, and everybody was frustrated. And I wish at that moment I would have stepped up and, and maybe said something, and I didn't. And, uh -huh. and that might be my one big regret from that game, that I just like, hey, imagine if we – I just uh, – this is what – I have said it. I thought about it a million times. All right, say it. I wish I would have yeah. got in there and said, imagine if we come back from this. We will go down as the best U.S. men's national team in history. It'll be the, the biggest comeback of all time. Let's, let's go be that team for the next 45 minutes. If we fall short, we fall short. But let's go out there with the attitude that we got this. And, and nobody said that. Nobody had that energy. And I think that was one of the reasons why I was part of the team. And I didn't take it either because I was still kind of in my own feelings about what had happened and how I had performed but I actually went out there and had a hell of a second half. So I clearly embodied it myself, but I didn't necessarily share what I wanted, didn't verbalize what I wanted to, to get across. And so that, that's a little bit of a regret of yeah. mine. But that might be my own ego and control coming into it as well. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't sound that way. It sounds more like um, you're a communicator, you're a leader, you know, you were asked to step up in every way, and you probably in any other situation might have stepped up in that way, and maybe you just lost the moment fully and didn't, didn't lean in. Yeah. I, I just, I deferred to the leaders. You know, I was waiting for the Brian McBride's and Claudia Reyna's of the world to, to step up. And I didn't want to maybe overstep yeah. my spot in the team, which kind of talks, talks about, uh, you know, intra team. Yeah. Dynamics. Teammate politics. I mean, that's a whole, yeah. probably a whole other podcast around, yeah. around yeah. that. Um, but I, uh, yeah, but the in the team politics and that gets into a whole other side of uh, doing stress together and doing stress as a, a group and in, in the in the the hierarchies that are there and the and the kind of unspoken implicit rules around who has what role and 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 sometimes overt. But I wanted to go more towards you, I think really towards your coaching um, philosophy because I think in a way that, you know, you're at a place in your life where you're now on the other side of helping young people find their way through what you found your way through. Right. And I think you do, a, you do a really beautiful job in all your social media posts around connecting with people in a very authentic way. It's always fun, like to see the energy you bring and the enthusiasm, which you talked about. So, you know, uh, I, I, I like that and I know other people like it too. Um, but I wanted to go towards, is kind of like a way to kind of consolidate where you've come to with your own arc of your own professional career of how you approach the, the younger generation and help them and what you see as like the role of yourself as a coach in relationship in some to, ways, between the headspace. Yeah. The headspace is an interesting one because ultimately I have to get to know the players better to understand what motivates them, what their driving force is. So no matter what level I'm coaching, I try to take into account that it's going to take me a little bit of time to get to know them. And some of them are guarded, very guarded. They've got walls up and, and, and some are very open. And so how do you, how do you approach that? And it's been great. Uh, I, I, I actually think that coaching younger players is a great stepping stone to understanding mentality and, and, and you get to kind of, try stuff in a way and it's almost more challenging than coaching pros because pros it's more about managing ego and expectations and and giving them little insights of course how you get into those conversations are important you got to know those people too but you can you can i think you can be more 
brass tacks with them, right? You can, you can be a little bit more absolute in terms of, hey, you need to work on this. And they know what you mean. You don't have to say it 15 times. Not all the players, but, but most of them. <laughs> 95% of the players, you can kind of say, hey, I need you to do this, this, and this. And they, they, they understand the concepts. Then it's up to them to execute. With the younger players, they, they, most of them don't have the technical, tactical ability to, to necessarily do what you know that they're capable of, but they can't see it for themselves. So it becomes a much bigger challenge. And so the mental side of the game becomes super important. Not, not to say it's not for the pros, but they're a little bit more sophisticated in terms of their understanding in, in every level. But the young, So I'm talking about my under-10 girls rec team that I had last season. <laughs> For real? You and, had an under 10 rec team last season? Yes, my daughter, under 10 girls rec. And I loved every single minute of it because I was trying to teach concepts where I was wondering if they could grasp it at such a young age and not necessarily have the consistent ability to pull it off. But, but can we try it anyway? So there's a little bit of a testing ground for me. I had a whole bunch of uh, crash test dummies, uh, guinea pigs for me to try some things. But outside of that, I was trying to create a culture of enthusiasm for the game, enthusiasm of learning, and still a, a, like a level of accountability that I've seen you do and execute these things before. I'm going to expect that now, and, and I'm going to hold you to a standard that I know that you're capable of because you've demonstrated it before. Even though we could argue a couple of my kids never kicked a ball, and some of them, but, but I wanted them to feel like this was an environment that was positive and nurturing, but still not say tough, but still, I don't know, maybe tough's the word, but still like challenging them in a way that, that, that they knew that it mattered to me if they played well, that, that we were all in this together, but also on an individual level, I would pull them aside and say, Hey, maybe you think about doing this. So I didn't want them to kick the ball to kick it anymore. I, that, I wanted that to be out. I want you to go out there and make a decision. I want you to trap the ball and try to find a pass. Like, that's how you're going to get better at the game. I, and I said, listen, I don't care if you make mistakes, but I need you to actually fundamentally just try to trap a ball and make a decision. We can, we can fix the decision. I, can, I, can, I pull kids out and be like, hey, remember that pass? Because I wanted it to be fresh for them. Remember that pass? You trapped it and you made that pass down the line? I love that. And I'd pull them out. You know, sometimes you, we recognize subs at a young age as, failing right you get subbed off the fields because you're failing i pull them off and i give them positive reinforcement i just wanted to bring you off to tell you that that pass you made that touch and that i love that wow and why don't you why don't you go get some water and I'll, i'm going to put you back in very soon wow and so i tried to create this culture of flipping flipping some of the stereotypes that i think come with with uh what kids know in other sports or even in, in other teams and try to foster that type of growth mindset and that growth environment and I didn't really, I didn't know how well it was working. There are obviously some days where like, dude, these kids are not listening to a word I'm saying. And I, <laughs> why did I agree to do this? You know, I'm not going to pretend that that didn't exist. Those, right. those days definitely existed. Yeah. But at the end of the whole thing, we get knocked out in the playoffs or whatever. And everybody's sad. Like I had kids crying because they, they weren't crying because they lost. They were crying because they knew our season was over. And I didn't really, I think, I tried to be very comforting, but I didn't understand the depth of why they were crying until we had our team party like a week later or two weeks later. And I had parents coming up to me because I told the kids, hey, our practice starts, and I told this to the parents, our, technically our practice starts from, well, goes from 4 to 5.30, but I want you to get your kids there at 3.45 because we can do some you know, quick feet ladder stuff. We can work on some other things. That, that don't necessarily need a lot of field space. And we can do that off to the side until the field's available. And one of the kids who was so, she never said anything, never said a word. But her mom comes up to me afterwards at the team party and says, my kid would get into the car and urge me to go to practice because she didn't want to be late for that 15-minute thing because she wanted to work on her footwork. I would never have known that. But I had parent after parent say that all of our kids were so sad that this is over, that they feel like, They've lost something because it's done. Mm. And that's why they were so sad they lost. It was really impactful for me because it really reinforced that I was building a culture that was special. And we were only together for three months. Imagine if you extrapolated that over a year or if you're working with, with kids. You know, then you've, I'm laying groundwork for these kids. One, 
to know and, t- and know what it should feel and taste like to be in a growth environment and hopefully seek that out moving forward. So if they recognize they're in a space that's not great, not to see it in a negative way, but just to say, okay, this person isn't for me. I'm still going to try to figure out how I can grow within that because I think you can still learn from bad coaches. Uh, my, 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 a couple of my daughters have had those, as, as most kids have. We've all had some, some coaches like, eh, a little suspect as you get older as, and you look back, like, yeah, that guy didn't know or her, him or her didn't know what she was doing. So, so that was really important for me. And I think it's helped inform me as to how I want to coach when I get to the pros, because those little things, those little, you know, pulling them off as a sub, the positive reinforcement really matters. So ultimately that's a really long way of me saying that when I look back on my own career and how I want to give back, I just want to pay it forward. And all of it is in a positive way. There's, there's a famous Nelson Mandela quote right? When he was in jail, he says, I never lose. I either win or I learn. And, and I love that quote. And I try to, especially when I coach, I try to live by that to make sure I don't fall into the traps, the easy traps of frustration, or uh, there's always something to teach and learn. So when I look at coaching, I look at it more as as being a teacher and, and, and not only as, as a player, but as a human being and using these moments to help these players grow. And so it's, it's, it's awesome. I love it. I think I'm built for it. But I fell down this media rabbit hole for a little while. So <laughs> I'm going to see that out to the 2026 World Cup and then most likely transition into coaching full time. Well, that's beautiful. All that's so beautiful, Jimmy Conrad. I love your passion, um, enthusiasm. And I, and I really hear for me, you know, it's, it's more of on my personal side around how I grew up and the struggles I had. But through your own life is you learned how to learn. You learned how to overcome. You learned how to grow. And it wasn't always easy and it wasn't without setbacks or it wasn't without hardship. And I really hear how you focused with these, you know, young girls. So sweet. It's such great energy to coach a group of young girls. I've, oh, done, yeah. I've done it, right? It's just like. It's the best. It's yeah. really, it's great. Now, my, my daughter knows I'm a, I'm, I'm a bit goofy, you know, so. But for everybody else, it's a bit of a, a new experience uh, for entering into my world of personality. But uh, even my daughter, like she went from not really caring. This is probably one of my prouder dad moments too, is that yeah. she went, and I didn't push her, but she went from like, eh, I don't really, I, I want to be out here, but I'm not that interested to honestly, last practice, she pulls me aside. She's like, these, these four girls don't care today. Like what, <laughs> why don't they care? And I said, I love you. I absolutely <laughs> love you, you know, because, because yeah. she develops a little bit of, this matters. And, and so a part of what I was getting across, though in a positive way, like, let's, let's, we're out here. Let's do something with this. Let's, let's make this matter. Let's make this, this time that we're spending together and try to turn it into something special. And, and I think we achieved that, which was, uh, honestly, of all the coaching I've done and all the things that I've done, one, one of my proudest accomplishments was some of the feedback that I got from the parents and players after the season was over. I feel you on that. I, I think some of my own uh, moments are those more personal, smaller moments of the things I go. That's a kind of achievement, right? That's a kind of achievement. So, um, and I, it's so tempting to keep going, but I, I want to be respectful. <laughs> cool. We can do a part two. If this, you yeah, know, yeah. If, there uh, might there no might problem. be another thing there, but um, yeah, we don't. There's there's plenty to explore. I'm sure. No, there story, is, so. and you're so fun to talk with. I mean, I. I you know, just on a side note, I'll, I when we were playing pickup the a couple of weeks ago before the the Liverpool Man City game, and I, yeah, I yeah. really I said two, two. was yeah two two yeah that's <laughs> right two two, two. two. Yeah. which was what it was last time the time before right. too right two that's two right. that's a good that's call right. for that that those teams but um I really appreciate your your communication and your fun your energy so anyways oh thank you thank you. Let me just tell you one more time, Jimmy Conrad, thank you so much for bringing your life story here because it really did start from, you know, when you were brought into the world and the seed of energy that you felt called to make your life worth something. And it's such a beautiful testament to how you have found different ways of doing that. So thank you for being on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us today. All music is performed by the incredible and effervescent Chase Jackson at chasejacksonmusic.com. Please support this podcast by following us on your favorite streaming platform, sharing it with your community and friends, and by making a modest donation to our Patreon page. To learn more about this show, our guest, as well as Jeffrey and his work helping people make peace with their human nature, go to howhumanswork.us.